So welcome everyone to this uh, launch of a deniable conflict back channel negotiation in Northern Ireland by Neil O'Doherty, uh, published by Oxford University Press, which has just appeared. Our launcher this evening is Ian McBride. Thank you very much, Ian, for being here. I will introduce uh, both of our panelists in a moment. Uh, first of all, I wanted to welcome you again. Uh, my name is Daniel Carey. I'm director of the Moore Institute at uh, National University of Ireland, Galway. Neil's book is a major contribution to the field and a great achievement. It's the work of many years. And I just wanted to make one note that it's, it's based on a, a range of interviews, sources, historical research, and archival research. And some of the archival research he was able to conduct here on the Brendan Duddy papers. But there's a particular reason why he conducted the research here, because he was responsible with the Duddy family for the archive coming to NUI Galway. So a source of, of great um, inspiration. Uh, to us and there was a wonderful launch of that archive that I remember very vividly with the Duddy family in Galway. So just wanted to mention that in particular. Um, we've had over 170 people sign up for the session, uh, which is fantastic to see so much interest in this book and uh, to congratulate Neil on this, on this great occasion. So now I'll just make a brief introduction uh, to, to our speakers and I will begin with, with Neil himself. He is personal professor of political science and sociology at NUI Galway, and he's the director of the new MA in public policy. Neil has published extensively on, on the Northern Ireland conflict, on peace negotiations, and on territorial conflict. His publications include Civil Rights to Armalites, a study of the escalation of conflict in Northern Ireland, and Dynamics of Political Change in Ireland, co-edited with Katie Hayward and Elizabeth Meehan, and of course, his new book, Deniable Contact, which has brought us together today. Ian McBride is Foster Professor of Irish History in Oxford and a fellow of Hartford College. His books include the edited collection, History and Memory in Modern Ireland, and the Princeton History of Modern Ireland, edited with Richard Burke. He's the author of 18th Century Ireland, The Isle of Slaves. Currently, he's completing work on the Irish political writings, of volume one, that is, um, for the new Cambridge edition of the works of Jonathan Swift. He's also published essays on the history of the conflict in Northern Ireland, including a chapter on IRA, IRA memoirs and the peace process and the truth about the troubles in a volume edited by Jim Smith in 2016. If not for the lockdown, Ian says he would be in Rome now making progress on a half-written book about Irish Catholics under the penal laws based mostly on sources in the Vatican archives and propaganda fide. Ian, again, thank you very much for being here for launching the book. And uh, I invite you to kick off the proceedings. So. Yeah, thanks. Thanks a lot, Dan. I, I should explain that um, what I'd like to do is talk for about 10 minutes about Neil's book and then ask him some questions about it before we throw the whole thing open um, to the floor. Uh, so uh, I'm really delighted uh, to participate in the celebration of this book. Um, uh, the publication of a book like this is a rare event because it uh, profoundly transforms our understanding of the Northern Ireland conflict. It's indispensable, of course, for anybody who wants to know how peace was achieved in the 1990s. Uh, a remarkable conjunction of stars that I still find miraculous. But it also sheds a lot of light on how the British state and the Republican movement thought and functioned um, from 1969 onwards. And we'll be exploring some of those themes and um, teasing them out, I hope. It's a major event also because of the reputation of the author all Neil's work is distinguished by sharp analytical intelligence, by theoretical sophistication, by the ability to combine insights um, from political science and social science with historical reconstruction of a very patient, painstaking kind. Um, those qualities are evident in From Civil Rights to Armalites, um, the best book on the origins of the conflict in Northern Ireland, in the books that Neil has edited, and in the many articles that he's written on Buddy Sunday, on the IRA, on various aspects of political violence, and most recently on the party system in Northern Ireland. He's part of an international conversation about um, uh, political violence, civil war, insurgency, 
among the most original and accomplished scholars. And although we produce many um, superb scholars in Ireland, not many of them are actually taking part in that conversation. At the same time, of course, the story he tells in Deniable Contact is a compelling one because it's got a cloak and dagger dimension that can grip the, the general reader. It presents alternative, um, sometimes improbable heroes in the conflict. Um, they are the, the quiet intermediaries, clergymen, businessmen. Uh, they are British civil servants um, like Sir John Chilcott or Sir Quentin Thomas, who were um, advocates of an inclusive approach to the Northern Ireland problem and whose qualities of judgment and tenacity and imagination were matched on the Irish side by um, Sean O'Higgin. And of course, at the centre is a remarkable figure of, of Brendan Duddy, idealistic, uh, patient, desperate, enraged, depressed, uh, and worried that crossed wires in the various branches of the British intelligence machine um, might put his life in danger. Uh, Brendan Duddy was scrupulously honest and at the same time, at key moments, was consciously engaged in manipulating the IRA, members of the IRA, and British intelligence in the interests of peace. Uh, and it's a really remarkable story. Finally, um, on a personal note, I've known Neil, I think, pretty much since he began working on this topic. Um, I, I've um, long had a theory that researchers grow more and more like their subjects in the same way that pet owners um, come to resemble their cats and dogs. And so if you're persuaded by this, you might think that experts on the Northern Ireland conflict are solipsistic, histrionic, territorial, conspiratorial, paranoid, and ruthless. And um, as it happens, um, anybody um, who's ever been in a university department uh, will know that um, these qualities are not completely unknown among academics. But Neil, in contrast, is a remarkably generous, easygoing, collegiate personality, uh, unusually free from the besetting sins of academic life. And that's one of the reasons why he's been a, a successful organiser and builder of collaborations and networks, both within Ireland and internationally. So um, <clears throat> the subject of the book, um, very quickly, is uh, subterranean peacemaking. It revolves around three minutes of three moments of very intense contact between the British state and the Republican movement, 1972, uh, 1975, and then 1991 to 93, the final talks that delivered a ceasefire. But beneath that, there's a whole um, world of um, localized cooperation between members of the RUC, members of the IRA, and so on, negotiating over the release of prisoners, the release of the victims of kidnappings, and over the hunger strikes. And my own favorite chapter in the book um, is largely focused on the 1980 hunger strike, um, which Neil narrates as, as a negotiation frustrated by the clash between the, the bureaucratic timetable of the British state and the, the body clock, the clock um, set by the deteriorating physical condition of the um, hunger strikers themselves. All that um, fine grained analysis bears out Neil's observation that scholars should not only ask why violent confrontation escalated so calamitously in Northern Ireland, but also why it didn't get worse. Um, let me make just two more quick observations um, before I ask some questions. It, a very distinctive characteristic of Neil's writing is his awareness of how our picture of the conflict uh, has been slanted by the enormous resources the British state poured into Northern Ireland, by its ability uh, to shape the way the conflict has been presented in the media and by the fact that so much history has been based largely on official sources. 
Um, and of course, he has built up, he's created his own archive uh, in, in a way. Um, the Duddy papers are part of that to some extent, an archive of witness seminar material and interview material. But the point I really want to make is that throughout the book, he shows um, how it's possible to decode the behavior of institutions and individuals who were working systematically to conceal their motivations and resources because they were engaged in negotiation. And so there's a very subtle approach to source material uh, involved there. As Brendan Duddy uh, put it in one interview with Neil, um, in back channel diplomacy, quote, you halved everything you read in the media or you took it as the exact opposite, unquote. The other point um, then concerns the continuities uh, within this story. I think it, it's, it's a recurrent feature of British policy making from 1972 onwards that successful settlement would have to include the provisionals. And that realism was accompanied by an interest in the struggles between hardliners and Republican, hardliners and moderates within the Republican movement. Um, Robert Armstrong uh, in 1972 encapsulated the problem in this way. The difficulty, he said, was to reformulate the declaration of intent, that is a declaration to withdraw on the part of the British, in a way that would be compatible with the commitment of the British to preserve the constitutional status of Northern Ireland as long as the majority of its inhabitants wished and yet still satisfy Republicans. So the problem was, was um, formulated very early on. On the Republican side, there was a willingness to compromise Neil shows on the core objective of Irish unification, making use of the concept of Irish self-determination and the idea of a constitutional conference that would bring together nationalists across the island. And again, it's interesting just how early on um, those features of the 1990s were anticipated. Republicans could not recognize the legitimacy of partition as imposed by imperial edict as they saw it in 1920, but they could accept partition if it was situated within and derived from the exercise of Irish self-determination. Uh, that presented a, a conundrum for the British and Irish governments of Nicene complexity, and yet it was resolved in the early 1990s, thanks to John Hume, to Sean O'Higgin, to Martin Manser, and on the British side to Quentin Thomas and David Cook in the shape of the Downing Street Declaration. Um, so, Neil, I, I guess the, my first question then is about this continuity, and it's about the sense of missed opportunities in the 1970s. And missed opportunities is, is explicitly or implicitly uh, a recurrent theme in the book. And I wonder how far you want to push that idea. Yeah, thanks, Ian. That's a great question. And thank you so much for that. Um introduction it was really lovely and uh you brought out so much so many aspects of the book that i'm i'm proud of and it was really nice to hear that uh sort of recognized um i so i don't want to push it too far so the danger is that we say oh there could have been a peace settlement in 1972 or 1975 if somebody had just behaved a little bit differently i don't think that's true but I think that the reasons for the failure are not the reasons we've been told. And that one of the things that's, that's really stood out for me is when, when I went back to try and trace what are the origins of this provisional Republican movement towards compromise and um, accepting a deal which is going to be disappointing when do those moves begin? And people associate that with the leadership in the late 1980s of Martin McGuinness and Jerry Adams. Uh, Brendan Doddy, you know, absolutely convinced me that that was uh, going on in 1975 as well, that the leadership during those talks was, al although they focused on withdrawal, really importantly, they were ready for a compromise that they knew was going to be very difficult 
to sell to their members. So they, you know, the principle that actually we want to move on, we want to move away from violence to peaceful methods, um, and we're willing to, to make a deal that's going to disappoint in people very deeply on our own side. But when I went back further, it's extraordinary uh, that you see that this process really begins at the very moment where the provisionals emerge as a significant force in 1971, at the very beginning, when they formulate their demands, that when, when you look at those sort of the conditions they lay down for the end of their campaign back in 1971, they don't demand unity. They don't demand the end of British sovereignty. They don't demand, um, uh, you know, a whole series of impossible things. They actually have these really interesting, quite open demands where you, you can see clearly that even if the British government doesn't meet their sort of three central demands at the time, the British government could absolutely go two thirds of the way or three quarters of the way to meeting them. And that might well be enough in the right circumstances to allow the provisionals to end their campaign. So I think from a very, very early stage, the leadership without over egging it, they see that you know, endless conflict, endless violence is no good for the movement, that there has to be a transition to peaceful politics. And that, that, that from a very early stage, I think they know that that involves very deep compromises. Mm -hmm. So what, uh, what do you think the, the war aims of the Republican movement were? Because it's, I think it's very clear from what, what you've written that there's greater flexibility and thought um, in Republicanism than many accounts have suggested. But you've got this, this um, term, the resistance point um, that arises in, in negotiation. What, what was their bottom line, do you think? Yeah, so the resistance point for, for people who don't know the negotiation terminology, that's the point below which you will not settle, you will walk away, you will prefer not to make an agreement. And I think a, a party itself, neither the Republicans or the British could accurately identify their resistance point until they were engaged. And that actually it's only in the process of engagement with the other side that you see um, what problems emerge on your own side with people who are resistant to change. So that the process of engaging with the other side starts off, it triggers all these internal struggles. And then you begin to see, well, what, what will your movement actually accept? And then, yeah, so in, in a sense, your resistance point only is only clarified in that process of engagement when you actually have to make those decisions. Hmm. That's a great answer. Um, okay, um, I'm, I'm just going to read you uh, something from the book uh, quotation. Um, British, uh, the British decision in 1989 to 90 to begin working towards a settlement that included provisionals was on the whole a more significant development than the rethinking of Republican policy in the 1980s. Do you want to expand a bit on, on that, on the changes in British policy? Yeah, and this is a, a conclusion that I came to over, over a long period. Uh, and the thinking on it sparked initially by Brendan Duddy's argument about where the Republican movement was in the mid 1970s, that is, seeking a settlement at that stage. Um, so people usually talk of uh, essentially the Republican leadership finally in the 1980s realizes it's not going to succeed and that it has to make a deal. And the British government then seeing this change, per, you know, decides to permit them or, or encourage them. And my view is that actually from, from back in 71 and 72, the Republicans are the ones who are keener on this. You know, they're, they're interested in, in this uh, more than the British are. Because for the British, it's, it's a difficult option, particularly in 1972 and 1975. The loyalist reaction is very difficult to deal with. So it's really problematic for the British government to contemplate a compromise 
with Republicans. And then in the late 1980s, I guess my view is that well before that, the late 1970s, the you know, 1983, 1984, the Republicans would probably have been open to engagement and compromise. But it was only in the late 1980s that the British government returned to it, having been open to it through, you know, from 1973 to through to 76, the British government was open to engagement, to, even if that didn't mean it would make a settlement or make an agreement, but they were open to the idea. But then that shut down from 77 until the late 1980s um, for various reasons, not just because of the British, not just because of Margaret Thatcher and Roy Mason before her, also because of the tactics of the IRA that were particularly provocative, made it particularly difficult for anyone to engage with them. Um, but yeah, so that's the view that, you know, once the British were open to settlement, the, the Republicans had been open to settlement well before that, I think. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I've got a different kind of question about the 1990s and about two uh, factors that might have been in the background. Uh, one is Europe and one is demography. And um, <clears throat> there's in the book, um, the, the man known as Fred, uh, uh, stroke um, Colin Ferguson, stroke Robert McLaren, British agent, is supposed to have said, uh, to, to supposed to have told Sinn Féin, it is going to happen anyway, this is Irish unity, it is going to happen anyway, the historical train Europe determines that we are committed to Europe, unionists will have to change, this island will be as one. So um, and Europe actually appears in the early drafts of the what becomes the Downing Street Declaration in, in the Hume Adams drafts, so that's one factor, I suppose, that might have um, facilitated uh, constitutional talks in the 90s. The other one, demography, I've heard suggested both by former IRA volunteers and by former British officials uh, that, that um, the IRA could go on fighting for another 20 years and maybe get a United Ireland. But in 20 years time, there would be a majority for a United Ireland in any case. Um, what do you think about those two factors, which are obviously topical at the moment? Yes, I'm, I'm one of those people who thought Europe was pretty marginal, but have been converted to the idea that the EU was more significant, not least in the context it provided and, and the way it changed relationships between Britain and Ireland. And I see Jada Lagana, uh, who has recently published a book on the EU, uh, a great book on the EU in Northern Ireland is here my former PhD student. Um, so I've learned a lot through her about the EU and the North. What's really interesting is that, uh, so the only evidence we have for those comments about the historical train being Europe is the Republican account of it, as far as I know. So Brendan Doddy's narrative, he wrote about that meeting, but he didn't mention any comments on Europe. And so we don't have another source for that. But I think the last sentence there is an interesting one. This island will be as one because it doesn't suggest necessarily reunification. What it suggests is that because of the Maastricht Treaty, which was going through the House of Commons in 1992 or 1993, um, if the conflict ends and the army posts can be removed and checkpoints can be removed, there will be no customs checks and therefore there will be free movement across the island. There will be free movement for labor, for work, um, for leisure purposes. There will be, people will have the feeling that the, the island has for all intents and purposes been unified. And I think that did come to fruition. I mean, and again, that's what's threatened by Brexit now, but that people did feel actually the fact that the UK is sovereign in the North is no longer an irritant to particularly to many nationalists. It's no longer an irritant in everyday life. It doesn't affect people negatively on an, on an everyday basis in the way that it did during the conflict. So I think you're very important and it's mentioned early on. I think it's Michael Oakley who talks about, 
I'm not sure where he said it, but it's a, it, he says that when he went to speak to Martin McGuinness in that very first conversation in late 1990 or early 1991, that he said he thought it was worth talking given the new context with the changes in Europe. So even at that first, and that was before the British government had approved contact, there is a sense among those involved in back channel contact that the Maastricht Treaty changes the conversation and, and opens up potential for, um, yeah, it, 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 it makes the chances of peace better. Mm -hmm. Um, and those early versions of the Downing Street Declaration that were kind of initially known as the Hume Adams document, those aspects of it that emerged as the Hume Adams document, had much more about Europe and the European Union than the eventual declaration. So when they began drafting it, uh, Hume and Adams and the Irish government promoted Europe to a very important place. I think it was Article 2 or Article 3 in, in the first draft declaration. It remained as Article two or three, um, but it shrank once the British government, um, you know, came in on the conversation. Mm -hmm. Sorry, and the other one was the yeah, demography. Yes, I think change. that's in the background. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Demographic change. Yes, so that's that's definitely there. And, and the issue of timeline is an interesting one. Uh, that's an issue back in 1975. So one of the British representatives said to Rory O'Brody, then president of Sinn Féin, who was involved in these weekly secret negotiations with British representatives, said to him, or actually it's in O'Brody's notes as well, said, you know, that the British are going, it's just our timeline is different to yours. You know, you want us out soon. You know, we'll go, but it'll take a while. It might take decades. I don't know if he said decades, but implicit in that is decades you know, really was implicit. And O'Brody, when I spoke to him, when I interviewed him, he said, well, they said, you know, could take a long time. And he said, well, that's, you know, from his point of view, that's understandable. That may well be a fair point to make, but that was a problem for the Republican movement. Mm -hmm. You know, that, was, that wasn't going to sell it. Yeah. You know, they weren't going to be able to make a deal on the basis that in the distant future, there would be a change. Mm -hmm. So, um, Neil, I, I shouldn't ask you too many more questions, but <clears throat> I suppose the one thing that's left on my mind is um, what what you think the the known unknowns are. What are the um, what are the things that still bother you about this um, story? What are the the mysteries that you think um, are not yet solved? I'm conscious that I'm constructing a story on on pieces of evidence that kind of emerge from the mist and that so much is invisible and I tried to make claims that could be sustained by the evidence that we have while being aware that there you know there may be other evidence that emerges in the future or evidence we will never get that changes our understanding of this but I I think kind of the story that I've told, the version is sustainable, that it, it may be modified in, in certain ways in the future, but that in its broad outline, it's sustainable. And um, yeah. Okay, great. Um, well, Neil, I, like, like Sinn Féin after the Downing Street Declaration, I've actually got 80 questions um, to ask, but I should probably shut up uh, and um, make some time for some of the audience to, to get involved. Thanks very much, Ian. Um, yeah, so what, what, what's gonna happen now is I think maybe, Neil, you wanted to make some, some, some remarks and some acknowledgements. So I think this might be a good opportunity to do that. In the meantime, just to alert the attendees, I'm, I'm now going to promote you to being panelists. Do not become alarmed. Uh, this means that you will have some additional functionality. Your, your, if you so choose, your, your, your image can appear and you can speak. You might wish to have both off and it's probably useful to have it muted unless you are speaking. That's a little bit of a slow process, but anyway, just to alert you that that'll be taking place. So maybe Neil, I can, I can sort of hand over to you and then I'll do that busy work behind the scenes. Yeah, thanks, Dan. Um, so I, I can't mention everybody that I'd like to because I'd be talking for more than 10 minutes, but I do want to mention my children, Kivan Dara, who were 
five and two years old, respectively, when I started working on this and who are now both adults, legally adults. So a shout out to Kiva and Dara and to Caroline, my wife from Derry, who is absolutely the person in, in um, behind the scenes the whole time, um, helping to um, guide me and steer me and, and keep me going in the right direction. Um, I want to, it's usual at events like this when people have traveled to kind of uh, shout out to the person who's come the furthest, but I want to do the online equivalent in, in the era of Zoom seminar and mention my brother who is the furthest away in terms of time zones who's in New Zealand and for whom it's now half past six in the morning and to thank him for, for getting out of bed. Um, so just to say, uh, you know, a, a lot of people out there in the acknowledgements, lots of people have been hugely important to me um, are here today. I'm sorry, I'm just seeing on the screen uh, Bren Brendan O'Leary and Brendan Moxivna, and Lorenzo Bosi. I'm just, I'm afraid if I start, it will take me too long to go on. Um, but I did want to mention as well, lots of old friends who are here. I'm delighted friends who are not in academia, but who I've known for many years and whose uh, company and conversations and support has been hugely important. To mention as well, the family of Brendan Duddy, who have been in Galway a number of times, who've taken part in witness seminars, who've spoken about their own experience um, and have been just, you know, hugely helpful in, um, especially after Brendan Duddy had a stroke and, and could no longer talk. Um, and after he died in, in continuing to talk about aspects of that experience um, that, that illuminated even further. Um, so I will, leave it at that for the thanks aware that there are lots and lots of people I haven't called out by name my apologies to them and I guess take some questions at this stage oh also to those I know there's some of the people who kindly gave them gave me their time as inter interviewees are also here oh there I see Daniel so Danny Sokach who's uh, connected in from San Francisco delighted to see you here and friends from Derry and Belfast and and elsewhere. Okay, thank you to everybody. And I hope that there'll be some kind of in-person celebration at a later stage mm -hmm. after COVID. Okay. Uh, yeah, we, well, I'm, I'm making progress, slow progress with steady progress in <laughs> promoting people to panelists. It is a somewhat, uh, you know, laborious um, process. I had actually a couple of questions if I might throw that out. And by the way, uh, this is an opportunity as well for people to ask questions and, there is, I think if you sort of move your cursor around, you should see a raise hand option. If you don't under reactions, there's a raise hand thing. That's probably the easiest thing to do because we have a number of pages now of attendees. But Neil, I wonder if I could ask you um, about the deniable element of the title of your book. Um, could you talk about that dimension and that dynamic? Well, the, there's um, a brilliant line from Brendan Duddy that he, he told me in one of my interviews with him. He said, the purpose of my existence was that so that a British Secretary of State could stand up in Parliament and honestly say that they were not in contact with the IRA. He said, that's why I existed, in order that a parliamentary question could be answered without misleading Parliament. Uh, that they weren't actually talking to the IRA, they were only talking to him, an intermediary, who was in turn talking to the IRA. So the deniable part of it is, is to give a government, the British government in this case, the freedom to maintain contact while also being able to say at the same time that they are not talking to the organization in public. Um, yeah, so that's a deniable part of it. And so in a sense, it's almost a technical point that we need to be able to deny contact without lying or deny direct contact. Um, I, I can't help but think about things like the ministerial code, which has <laughs> become such a uh, feature of recent uh, recent discussion. But yeah, the political logic is certainly there. Um, could I ask you also about trial runs that seem to be, I mean, I suppose the people participating in them didn't necessarily see them as trial runs, but was there a dimension of a trial run and did that help or, or hinder later processes? Well, you have two earlier efforts to, 
to sort of have an agreement that ends the IRA campaign and includes the provisional Republicans in a settlement. And they're in 1972 and 1975. So they're not trial runs in the sense that they're, you know, they're seri serious efforts in their own right. And the first one in 1972 collapsed quite quickly. And the general agreement was, oh, there was no possibility of, of any settlement, you know, that, you know, the, the goals of the IRA were impossible, they couldn't be met. But when you drill into it a little, what you see in 1972 is it doesn't break down over demands and goals or, or uh, you know, a collapse of negotiations. It breaks down because of a local clash in Lenadoon and West Belfast. And when they have a ceasefire in 1975, the two sides agree to set up uh, a whole series of incident centers. And the purpose of them is specifically to prevent another Lena Dune. So there's a shared recognition in 75 that the 72 ceasefire uh, failed because, it, well, or, you know, it's not that it would necessarily have succeeded otherwise, but that they, they couldn't allow the same thing to happen again in 1975. They would at least deal with that problem. So in a sense, they'd learned something from 1972 by 1975. In 1975, again, not a trial run. I think on both sides, there, there is a sense that there, there might be a deal, that it might, it might be possible to converge uh, on an agreement. And that that lasts, uh, uh, although people talk about the, the provisionals being strung along on the British side with Prime Minister Harold Wilson, until late in 1975, he is actively interested, we can see from the UK archives, in the possibility that this might result in a deal. So it hasn't, that hope on the British side, uh, certainly at the level of the Prime Minister, has not evaporated by the end of 1975, although on the Republican side, it has pretty much evaporated by that stage. In terms of it being a trial run, 75 is interesting because, um, the evidence that we have suggests that between 91 and 93, Brendan Duddy is constantly saying to his British interlocutor, you can't do what you did in 75. They are rightly suspicious of you because of what happened in 1975. So in a way, there was this idea in 75 that we have to make sure the same thing doesn't happen in 70, that happened in 72. And then in 91 to 93, the British are being told, don't do 1975 again you know, they're suspicious of you, don't try to, um, you know, this time really make a deal. And the view of Brendan Duddy as intermediary was the Republicans were open to a deal in 1975, even if a deal, ultimately a deal may not have been possible. You know, I'm I, like, I think that's an argument, you know, that's quite a strong argument in a way that there were all sorts of other factors against it, but nonetheless that, the, the idea of a compromise of, of settling for something far short of their expectations was, you know, strong there within the Republican leadership. One of the implications of what you're saying, I guess, is, is also thinking about um, changes of government, changes of Northern Ireland minister and so forth. Um, I mean, how does that, how did that affect the dynamic? I mean, you have, you have to have the people who have the historical memory and the intimate, also the relationships that provide continuity in that context. I mean, is that, is that part of the story that you're, you're telling? Yeah, there's a really striking continuity. So not just between, um, so Michael Oatley, uh, MI6 intelligence officer is there in 19, you know, 1974 and 1975. Well, actually from, from late 1973, he establishes the contact from the British side in a, you know, in a much stronger form than it had existed prior to that. Um, and he's there again in 1980 during the 1980 hunger strike and he initiates the first meeting in 1990. So he and Brendan Duddy had developed this, you know, strong personal connection and, and personal relationship. And that was a crucial part of the reestablishment of links in 1990, sort of the, you know, there was a relationship of trust between the two of them on which it provided a kind of foundation on which you could build. But the other continuity is, I think, of, and I write about this in the chapter on the hunger strikes, is between 1975 and 1981. So this is something that's, that's discussed in the book, but that people 
were not aware of before this. So the British negotiator on the British side in 1981 was also a British negotiator in 1976 and a person who had met with Brendan Duddy on numerous occasions and had actually negotiated with Brendan Duddy on the hunger strike of Frank Stagg in 1976. So the same person is back again in 1981 as the British interlocutor with Brendan. Duddy. So these in 1981, you have two people who have already six years previously negotiated a hunger strike. Fascinating. That is very, very interesting. Um, it's actually maybe an opportunity to get you to say something a little bit more about Brendan Duddy and in your own relationship with him. Um, obviously a remarkable figure, but I don't know if you'd like to talk a little bit more about him. And Yeah, I will. And then I see there's a question from Brendan O'Leary, which I'll take after that, if that's okay. Yeah. Excellent. Dan? Yeah. Um, yeah, so Brendan and I... And I'm conscious that members of Brendan's family are here. And of course, we've, you know, we've uh, met a lot and, and talked a lot. And um, I hope that they feel I, I did him justice in the book. But I wanted to give, convey as well in the book that it was his. So he was uh, emotional, as his family will say, he was a, a, a person of strong emotions. He was also an incredibly committed and, and persistent individual but he was also tough and that was crucial. And the business, but you know, my overwhelming impression after years of talking to him is that his toughness, his hardness was a really vital part of contributing to peace, that he was willing to press, to pressure, to demand, to insist and to issue ultimatums. And so it's, it, you know, and I think partly it's, it was connected to his business experience, his experience of, you know, negotiating with, with people in a situation where you're trying to get as, as much as you can. Um, and I think he brought to the making of peace um, a necessary toughness. Very interesting. Brandon, yeah, please uh, ask, uh, ask your question. Thanks. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Warmest congratulations, Neil, a magnificent achievement. <clears throat> I was fortunate enough to read the manuscript in progress, so I can warmly recommend the book to everybody. It has the whodunit qualities. It also has excellent social science, and it is uh, a wonderful tribute, direct and indirect, to the work of Brendan Duddy and those like him. I'd like to ask a kind of tacky question, if you don't mind, Neil, and it may be related to your point about resistance early, earlier. In negotiation theory, there's this notion of BATNA, your best alternative to a negotiated agreement. And if you're a rational negotiator, you're supposed to calculate it. And that's what makes you decide whether or not to persist or not. Do you get any sense on either side of sustained rational calculation of the BATNA? Is it happening? Or is this uh, a, another example of worthless rational choice thinking? So there's a um, you know, wonderful story that I was told by Leo Green, who was one of the Republican negotiators after he was released from prison in 1995. And I'm not sure if it was in the version of the book that you saw, it might've gone in later. But he was released in 1995. He'd been one of the hunger strikers in 1980. He joined the talks team. He went up to the Sinn Féin office in, in West Belfast. And the person behind the, the desk said, OK, you've, you've joined the team now. Take a copy of that book and read it. And he pointed to this red and yellow paperback, which anyone in conflict resolution, lots of you will immediately recognize as getting to yes the book that popularized the concept of BATNA. And um, so like the Republicans were telling their ex-hunger strike, ex-prisoner negotiators, read about integrative negotiation, read about BATNA, read about how, you, you know, how to make an agreement that's mutually beneficial. And so I think that uh, thinking, conscious thinking about negotiation within the Republican movement 
goes way back. It's clearly present there. They're, they're getting some bad advice in the early 1970s to bargain hard, old fashioned. They're, they're talk, talking to trade unionists, specifically in terms of BATNA. Um, of course, what they say about BATNA, your best alternative to ne negotiate agreement is that you should strengthen it, you know, to give you uh, maximum leverage. So your alternative should be good in the case of the Republicans and the British, that meant maximize your, you know, your, your, sorry, your victories on the battlefield, if you like, you know, the stronger you are in, in coercive power, the better your alternative to negotiation. Um, on the British side, I once asked, I'm trying, uh, oh yes, on the British side, a senior civil servant told me he had read a book on negotiation. Sorry, this is just a, an example, um, an anecdote. He said, yes, I, I don't think I found all that much that was useful in it. I think what's really crucial is the specific situation you're in. But I think on both sides, people are, you know, reading about negotiation, thinking about negotiation theory. And I think it would be a great question to ask, just to go around and, and ask about those concepts and people's familiarity with them and resistance point or BATNA or integrative negotiation. Thank you. Thanks, Brendan. There's a, uh, a, a question or comment that's come in from Paula Dover, which is in the Q&A area. And it was a, she says, I was involved in the peace program at the beginning, 1996 to 2001. And we had a guy from Foreign Affairs who used to attend the monitoring committee meetings, particularly those in the North. He really didn't have a role, but the meetings were a good excuse for his presence in the North, where it was meeting contacts behind the scenes. That's not deniability as such, just straight undercover. <laughs> so... I don't know if that requires a sequel to your book, you know, when you, you could undercover context, but uh, I don't know if you wanted, you wanted to uh, comment on that, Neil. Well, Travis, Sean O'Higgin, who was pivotal to, uh, on the, I mean, the crucial person on the Irish side in the negotiations in the 1990s, in the late 1970s, his job as a Department of Foreign Affairs official was to go around the North meeting unionists quietly, not, not secretly, so to speak, but they would meet in places where they were unlikely to be spotted and where there were unlikely to be any reports, but he would meet people associated with loyalist paramilitary groups, with the Ulster Unionist Party, with the Vanguard, you know, people. Uh, and again, I think that's, I, I spoke to Sean O'Higgin a little bit about that. Um, and that's certainly worth these kind of informal visits. And I write in the book about the way in which MI6 officers so much of their influence was exerted by these sort of popping into people for a chat. That's how you spread, you know, um, spread ideas and help to influence people. And you have the Irish Department of Foreign Affairs doing similar things. You know, not in, it's, it's not about exerting a direct effect on what people do, but on, you know, having conversations, getting a sense of where people are at, what's sometimes referred to as political intelligence and doing it in a, in a quiet, quiet way without any fanfare. A couple of other things have come in on the chat that I wanted to bring to your attention. So one of our attendees says, you mentioned that the British government would have been willing to negotiate with the Republicans in the early mid 1970s. <clears throat> but do you think that the blanket protest ended this willingness and spurred change of strategy from one of openness to negotiation to one of crackdown? Yeah, so that's a good question. So uh, a lot of people locate the political journey of Sinn Féin as beginning in the hunger strike and therefore in some sense, the peace process originating with that turn to politics. I can, you know, I completely disagree and I'll, I'll write a little bit more about this at, at a later stage. In my view, the hunger strike so escalated, the protest and then the hunger strike so escalated the conflict that it pushed peace many years into the future. I think it completed, it delayed peace by several years. And I, I want to just, because it's a topic that I, I think is, it's really fascinating. Uh, I wanted to mention two bits of information. People think of this as a clash of, you know, principles that can't be reconciled. So two little snippets of information. One, in 1976, British officials and uh, prison authorities discuss the prison uniform. And the, Brit the view of the British officials 
is that they should let all prisoners wear their own clothes. That's in 1976. But the prison authorities push back and they say, no, they don't want that. They want them to wear uniform. So you have the, the dominant view within British officials in 76 at the very start of the prison protest is let them wear their own clothes. And on the other side, as the protest escalates in about 1978, Brendan Hughes, who led the first hunger strike, Bobby Sands, who led the second hunger strike, the two of them go to the other prisoners and they say, this protest is too punishing. What about we just put on the uniform and concede on that issue? And the prisoners push back. They're like, no, that would be total defeat. That would be crazy. We can't do that. But the people who propose that are the people who then led, you know, the people who actually, Bobby Sands, of course, died on hunger strike, Brendan Hughes, who led the first hunger strike, that they were willing to give on the prison uniform issue at the, at the same, not long after British officials were willing to give in the other direction. So it's not about these completely impossible, unreconcilable positions. It's about a failure in some way to avert escalation to avert um, you know, the intensification of confrontation. And that's about managing, on, on the British side, the prison officers are pushing back. And on the Republican side, the rank and file prisoners are pushing back. I have a question uh, from Peter Taylor. Peter, I wonder if you, you could sort of unmute and, uh, and ask your question. Mm -hmm. uh, can you hear me okay? Yes, indeed. Yeah. Great. Um, Niall, many congratulations on the book. I can't wait to read it. I think it's really, really important that you've been able to pull the threads of this it's totally fascinating and hugely important story. To say, call it a story is um, a misnomer. It's, it's a unique experience and many, many lessons have been learned from it. My question to you, and I'd be interested in your view, What's your view on the alleged, I stress, alleged message that Martin McGuinness sent to uh, the British government, to John Major, saying the conflict is over, but we need your, own, your advice on how to bring it to an end? Yeah, so Peter, it's really nice to see you here. And I should say, of course, you in many ways laid the foundations for this. And by talking to Brendan Duddy initially for your book, Provos, I mean, you told so much of the story back in in 1997 in that book. So I mean, that was an essential foundation for me in, in beginning this research. I, I write about the conflict is over message in, in the book. And uh, I remember I had spoke, I'd spent about three years talking to Brendan Duddy at, um, you know, at regular interviews, interviewing him. And I gradually built up to asking about the conflict is over message. And I said, so today, what I would like to ask you is, can, can you talk about the process that led to that message? And he said, um, oh, I think that's been pretty well covered already. <laughs> so that, that was Brendan's response to me. But what I will say about it is, um, we now know because Noel Gallagher has said that, that um, you know, in, in Albert Reynolds' autobiography, Noel Gallagher, who, who was Brendan Duddy's really linked to Martin McGuinness has said that he was in the hotel room in London with Brendan Duddy, with uh, Robert McLaren, when the message was written. Um, and I would say that, you know, Robert, it, well, I think what I say in the book is, you know, it, it reflects the view of, of Brendan, but also the two he was working with uh, Dennis Bradley and, and Noel Gallagher, their kind of sense of where the Republican movement was at, maybe with uh, Brendan and Robert McLaren's sense of what would fly with the British government, what would help to trigger action. So I take it to be kind of a, a combined effort. But again, I have not, that's, you know, Brendan did not tell me that they together wrote this message, but that's my sense of where it emerged from. But I, one of the interesting things in the book is that I, I spoke to John Chilcott about the message and, and he said, he said he and John Deverell sat down and, and the quote is in the book, they, they had to decide what to do with this message. And he said, I think it was fair to say that it didn't matter all that much. You know, it, it wasn't quite as important that it was a true bill coming from the IRA 
as that it had the potential to move things forward. Um, and so I think there's a sense in which that, you know, when it arrived on the British side, perhaps there was some sense that maybe they're not 100% certain, but nonetheless, it's very useful to have a message of this kind because it can help you move on to the next stage. I, I don't know what your current thinking on the message is or how that fits with it. My thought on that message is that it did not certainly did not come directly from Martin McGuinness. It was uh, the interpretation of McGuinness and his um, his movements thinking on 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 the on the peace process or what was to become the peace process, and I think it was what Michael Oatley certainly did in 1975 by talking about structures of disengagement, which is to encourage encourage movement on the part of the IRA and critically with the message allegedly, but not from McGuinness, was to encourage the Brits, the government to say, look, look you know, we're interested in movement, but you know, you've got to play your part. So I think it was, a, it was a message of its time, but not from Martin McGuinness that was hugely, who was hugely embarrassed and probably, he's, you know, he feared his, his life was on the line if it was attributed to him because it was seen in some quarters as surrender but I think it had the desired effect. But it, it was it was it was contrived by by Fred uh, and those who were with him. I think and, and Brendan. It was a comp composite message. Yeah, I, I think we're of the same view. Just to come back briefly, I, I mention in the book that the very first message Brendan brings to the British in September 1972 to Frank Steele, he brings him a message saying. Rory O'Brothy has said that he needs your help to deal with the hardliners in the Republican movement. It's the very first message. Mm -hmm. It's clearly Rory O'Brothy didn't send that message. But this idea that Brendan might be involved in, you know, taking his understanding of where the Republican movement was at and presenting it in the form of a message was something that he had done at the very outset of that contact in 1972. Coming towards the end of our time, but there's a, uh, something in the chat that I want to draw your attention to. Uh, so, uh, somebody who sa says they're from the Basque country under the Spanish rule. And right now we're on the warring political denial and backwards not only to advance on the definitive peace process, but especially on the narrative. What lessons, tips could be shared on our own socio-political peace process, advancing it both on the Spanish and on the French side? Ms. Carrick Asco, thanks. Don't know if you have any thoughts there. Uh, is there anything that lays a, a sort of a yeah a template even that's 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 available in other conflict situations? Well, it's it's sobering, um, you know, that it took so long. I mean, the North is not a great example in one sense. You know, here it only took thirty years, and um, you, you know it, it speaks to how extraordinarily difficult it is and what a, a painstaking long-term job it is. And I mean, I, I'm sort of very disheartened to see the way the turn events have taken in the Basque country and in Spain in, in the past dec or decade or so when it seemed quite hopeful initially. Um, and ultimately the, the settlement that was agreed in the North and in Ireland and between Ireland and Britain it did reflect the balance of forces. It, it reflected the, you know, the importance of the ending of the IRA campaign to the British state. It was worthwhile making a very difficult compromise on the part of the British state because the IRA campaign did cause serious ongoing problems. So it's not a very, um, you know, not a particularly comforting message, but, uh, Yes, but I mean, there are, well, obviously, uh, and actually I see people like Eamon O'Kane here and others. We've lots of people who've, you know, incredible expertise on the topic. Um, so there, there are useful things to be learned and, and um, the dynamics of mediation and the dynamics of negotiation, I guess, how, how important that they are. I'm sorry, I just wanted, I see one message that I just wanted to read out from Sarah Duddy to say that Brendan, Brendan's widow Margot is watching from Derry to say hello. I'm delighted you're here. And I, I interviewed Margot. Uh, unfortunately, 
so many people I interviewed, you know, I, I talked to them for an hour and a half and there's one sentence in the book from that interview. But I remember the interview with Margot was incredibly rich. There's so much there uh, and so many more things I would like to, um, you know, just to discuss that's in the, that interview because it gives such a different, you know, it's a very different view. It's a view kind of from the side of, of what was going on. Mm -hmm. I see Patrick, you have your hand, hand up there. Patrick, do you want to ask your question? Hi, can you hear me okay? Can do, yes, far away. Hi, Neil. Um, Hi. Congratulations. Uh, it, no doubt uh, it'll be a great read, you know. Um, I'm a bit facetious that, uh, just looking at the price, and I'll wait till the film comes out, you know, <laughs> get the DVD. Uh, just a few thoughts, um, and that keep you. Uh, I, I suppose as someone who was involved in the armed struggle in earlier times, uh, I, I'm just wondering on, on your take on the whole thing. I mean, it's as if that the movement went into armed struggle, yet wanted peace from day one. I, I in my own personal opinion, I mean, I can't see, I can't see where this where this der derives from. I mean, the ceasefire of '72 came along very quick. It ended in Lenin doing, but it wasn't Lenin. I mean, with with a loyalist uh, rampage of, of killing, you know, so many twenty or thirty nationalists in the period of the two weeks. Volunteers been arrested, British troops coming into nationalists. I mean, just Lenin doing just became the straw. There was nobody within the Republican movement wanted to talk peace for the sake of peace at the end of, of July 1972. If we go to 75, and we discussed this in the cages, and the IRA was the closest to defeat in 1975 than they were in the whole 30 years. And we discussed in the cages and how, how they were led into this um, this uh, ceasefire for a year, which almost devastated the movement. Um, the war went on. The war took its took its uh, its direction. Uh, you know, there was nobody interested in 1981. Um, you know, when Bobby Sands and the rest of the guys died, I mean, half of the Belfast Brigade volunteered to go to London, you know, to, to take actions in London. They were so, so disgusted with things. I, I don't imagine he would have said to anyone then, oh, yeah, we'll have a little peace talk. Um, when it came to the 1990s, Neil, and you're, you're more aware, I mean, than most, the war it took its course. It had come to the end. I mean, it, 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 there was no further to go, I mean, except more people have been killed on all sides. And that could have went on like the 56 campaign with one guy with a rifle and, and South Armagh firing across the border and just dragged it on for years and years. But the movement had realized it was time to talk then, you know. And, and I just think maybe the suggestion that all the time the movement really were belittling us as volunteers by, by wanting to, to create a negotiated thing with the British and yet letting us go out and get people getting 20 years for nothing and dying for nothing. You know, uh, that seems to me like a subplot that I'd, I'm not sure is exactly correct, you, but, I, you know, you'll beg my pardon yeah. for your own suggestion. Just one more thing before I finish. I thought I read recently, your, uh, Peter, Peter, um, oh, sorry, the BBC guy, I forget his name. Uh, was it not Dennis Bradley who was supposed to have written the letter saying, allegedly from Martin McGuinness, and then Father X priest Dennis Bradley says that he wrote the letter. He, he revealed that recently. He actually wrote the letter saying, we're interested in peace and not McGuinness. I don't know where you've come across that. Yeah. Sorry, I'll come back on that, but I'll try and come back on it fairly briefly, Paddy. Yeah. And uh, good to see you. Um, so I, I think that Dennis Bradley, uh, well, that sort of, that account was subsequently modified. 
So uh, okay. I, I don't think, yeah, the account wasn't completely accurate. Okay. It, there's a difficulty for the leadership. So in 1971, the, you know, the War of Independence had lasted three years back in 1919 to 1921. In 1971, the leadership it neither wants nor is planning for 20 or 30 years of a campaign. It has to end at some stage and the leadership has to consider how will it end? And it's the same in 1975, how long? So I guess what I'm saying is that realization that, you know, sometime it will have to end, sometime it will run out of steam, that that realization is there at quite an early age or at an early stage. And as a leadership, that's, you know, as you're saying, that's an extraordinarily difficult position to be in. You have people who are going out, risking imprisonment, risking their lives for a cause. But at the same time, you know that at some stage, this will, you know, there will be a kind of set, there will be a settlement, and it is likely to involve difficult compromises. Um, just, sorry, there was one other thing about that. The 1975 ceasefire, uh, like there was a sense, oh, the, the IRA was weakened. The British archival documents are fascinating. In June, 1975, months into the ceasefire, June, 1975, the head of the British Army in the North meets with Merlin Rees, the Northern Ireland Secretary of State, and the head of the British Army and a senior officer say, the IRA is getting stronger every day. They are the strongest they have been in months. We have to stop this situation. The ceasefire is benefiting them. It's going to be more and more difficult. And there is a view within the British Army that the military advantage of the 1975 ceasefire was, was towards the IRA rather than to the British Army, that actually at the end of 74, they should, the British Army should have been allowed to finish off the job rather than going into these talks. And I think the talks on the part of the British government were a genuine attempt. They took that risk, they took those chances because they saw there was a genuine attempt or possibility of a compromise peace settlement. And nobody knows where the compromise will end up until you've reached that final moment of deciding. So you may know it's gonna be a difficult compromise, but you won't know what the shape of it is, what's feasible until you're in the process and, and making decisions about it. Well, I might come back now to maybe to Ian for just a, a thought. And I don't know what, Ian, in, in the work that you've done historically, are there any precedents for this? Uh, you're, you're dealing of course with a period in which and so much of Neil's work has been done through oral history naturally, but is there anything that you've found historically that, that resonates with some of the stories that have emerged uh, partly from our discussions tonight or from the book? You're muted there, Ian, yeah. Sorry, I was muted. Not very specifically, but I mean, it's, it's uh, I suppose it's um, normal in Irish history for conflicts to end in very untidy ways. Uh, with um, messy compromises that hadn't been foreseen. I mean, there are messy compromises after the 1798 rebellion, um, when some of the United Irishmen are allowed to do a deal with the British government um, and essentially give their uh, truthful account of how they organized uh, a mass Republican movement in Ireland um, in return for um, uh, being allowed to take off to the United States. Uh, I was, I, I mean, one of the things um, struck me as we were talking um, was that uh, it's nice to hear Peter Taylor's voice, which I know incredibly well, like many people here have watched his documentaries over and over again. Um, one of them is called The Enemy Within. And there's a scene in which there's a, um, a discussion of chips in the prison. And um, sausage the, rolls. Sorry, sausage rolls. Was it sausage rolls? I I, I thought it was chips. I and I but I can remember the the IRA prisoners saying, you know, it's it's not the number of them. It's just the size. They're getting smaller. And um, there's this, you know, it's a very civilized discussion on standards of food inside the prison. I remember watching this and thinking, well, there you go. Um, that's what's going to happen outside uh, the the prison. And we had um, to sub we had to subtitle that because it was the days of the broadcasting restrictions, and it was an IRA 
volunteer speaking on behalf of the IRA because he was the IRA's food spokesman. Ah, brilliant. So, I mean, I suppose that's one um, question I, I, I had. I wondered how far um, discussions inside the prison influenced uh, political directions and political possibilities outside. There's another question about the, the 75 ceasefire or truth. Um, it's an interesting one because it would be presented by um, Jerry Adams as a mistake. Uh, and yet Adams must have learned from it. Um, Neil talked about what the British learned from it. And clearly Adams must have studied it in the same way for lessons, even though in a sense that's, that truce was um, part of the, the story of the rise of Adams in a way. It was the negative example that proved why Adams' leadership uh, was possible. So there's a few, they aren't comments, they're um, further questions, I suppose. The only other thing I, I want to say is please do um, buy the book. Oh, I, sh I should take this opportunity to say that although it's outrageously expensive because of these academic pricing models, there is a voucher code, which maybe we can uh, send to people on the attendance list. It makes it a bit cheaper but also the like the go-to solution for such an expensive book as well is to or ask your library to order it or or get it through university library or, or your local library. Um, but I, I don't know, Dan, if we can share that that um, voucher gonna, code or not. Yeah, I'm going to try to work on that that technical challenge. Uh, Shauna Duddy wanted to say uh, say a few words. So, Shauna, I wonder if you're available there. If you could unmute and uh, over to you. Uh, I just wanted to thank Neil for the book, and um, I think we would be right in saying from the whole family that we're very proud of you, that you did a good job, and maybe let some the listener know how much we had to suss you out before we handed over the material, and I would say that we're probably very glad that we did, although at the time it was a big move from behind the scenes to actually go ahead and greedy given the, the uh, archive to you Galway and I just think listening to your book and the bits of bread and the grammar of bread we think you've done a good job. Thanks Sean I'm so glad to hear that and relieved and glad <laughs> to hear that thank you I'm, and I'm delighted to hear from you as well. No we, and, we, we've had a good enough uh, read at it but not thoroughly enough to um, throw anything back at you yet but I'm sure we'll find a few things but it was a it was a long journey just for quickness one night me and I went down there in November and there were we were having a lecture in the theatre and and Galway University and it turned out it was the wettest night in Ireland in 80 years so you can imagine the turnout and um it was when I got insight into you you put information on a up on the board that my father given you and then you put information from the from the queue and in, in England you know the, the the information that the British government had and you matched everything up so we were able to go back and say this boy does his homework he's a hard worker and he is stir and that was what started the confidence to think that you would <laughs> get the work but anyway all the best and i hope it's i hope it's read through I and mean, my father would be really proud of it more important yeah thanks a million sean and i learned so much from your father he oh. really transformed my understanding of things yeah well the work was there thanks that's a, that's a, that's a great note to end on. I, I perhaps at this point we should come to a close. We've 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 run substantially over our allotted hour, and uh, I want to thank everybody for being here, and above all, Neil for this fantastic book. Thank you, Ian, for a great launch and uh, for engaging so so closely with this work and and uh, explaining its importance, which was really extremely helpful and enlightening. So, thank you both. Um, and uh, again, congratulations. I suppose we could probably all unmute ourselves, clap and so forth. You see the good wishes coming through. So, you know, well done, great achievement. Neil, thanks very much. Very good indeed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
for coming thanks a million Danny. great to see Sorry, everybody Neil. right Neil and thanks for turning up and <laughs> Hi, family. There they are. Thank you. 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 See you. Good luck. Bye, guys. See you, Lorenzo. Bye, Neil. Great Thank to you see you all. Bye, bye, bye Neil. See you. Sloan Porik. Bye. bye. See you, Patty. Bye, Ricka. Bye, yeah, Brendan. Good luck, Neil. Sloan Gafo. Bye, bye, Neil. Bye.